my salvation. Um, I'd like to praise the Lord for both a healing and a provision um, from recently, um, directly following camp, both Will and I had gotten quite sick with something that I have had before. Um, and it typically was a long recovery when I got it last year. And so um, we just put it to the Lord um, that it would be a quick recovery because um, taking 10 days off and then immediately coming back to work, that wasn't quite the plan um, to happen for myself. And um, I was really lucky that work um, provided me an isolated area to continue working in for the most part. Um, until it got a little bit too too bad and then they sent me home um, for a few days. But I would like to praise the Lord that it only took about a week for us to be back to normal. Um, and I would like to praise the Lord for a provision as well. Um, it was a little while ago when Will had um, pulled something in his leg there and went to the doctors um, and they said that it was gonna be, um, they needed him to be off of it for at least five weeks for it to heal. Um, and it wasn't long after he had hurt himself that a sister came to me and she um, said, you know, there's the world dollar and then there's God's dollar. And she said, we're so lucky that uh, the Lord's dollar will carry us through. Um, and that's definitely what happened. Um, there is never kind of a doubt in that situation there, but um, about living on one wage between the two of us. but. Um, come August with camp um, and typically the first two weeks there is majority of the fees we have to pay we just put it to the Lord um, and the Lord has perfect timing it was only two days after camp um, when we got sick and I couldn't work um, that my tax return actually came in which was such a provision um, um, because it did take some time to actually be able to submit that this year since my marital status had changed um, we did need a social insurance number, which we were waiting on from his PR application. And so um, because it took some time to do that, um, the return came in at such a perfect time. And I just love to praise the Lord that he does carry us through all things. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank the Lord for something um, he did for us uh, last night. It's a little bit of a funny story that goes back a bit, so I won't go into all of it. But, um, yeah, we'd had someone um, who'd been egging our house and had been going on well, since before Berkeley was born. And um, I think the first batch are, like, um, up at night and looking out all the blinds. We've got quite a lot of windows that look out various directions. So. And we put it to the Lord, and um, the last time it had happened was actually the night I was in labor of all times. Um, we just hear this, yeah, and then we're down trying to find out who it is, and I'm having contractions, so it was quite a funny story. But um, yeah, last night we just heard a thought, it was like three in the morning. And, um, I guess it doesn't really matter what the, the story is, or how things happen, or um, what makes people do these things. Um, it was just, I just wanted the Lord to do something about it. Um, it just, we actually had found out what house it was coming from last time it happened, but we didn't have any evidence and Brian had got a security camera, but it didn't detect motion from that far away. Um, but I just got down and um, was seeking the Lord and um, Byron had a prayer as well. And um, I opened up the Bible to Isaiah and um, literally, you know, when you have those moments when the scriptures jump out at you and um, it was just about um, the, that the Lord God would help thee and it said it like twice in different ways and um, and not to be ashamed, that we wouldn't be ashamed and the Lord would, um, you know, not to be afraid of our enemies and, um, yeah, basically that the Lord was going to help. And I thought, well, I don't know how he's going to help. Byron had reported it previously to the police just to kind of have a record of the incidents, but um, they can never do anything. And anyway, this um, last night he reported it again, and the man just said that, um, yep, he, what would you like me to do? And I'm like, well, um, if you could say something, that'd be great. Um, yeah, so he went and addressed it, and the, the kid admitted it straight away and said he won't do it again. So um, 
even though it's yeah it's kind of a, a silly thing i just think it's amazing that what the lord can do in in these situations the scriptures we read the promises he gives and then the results there's always a result whether it's weeks or um that night and yeah that was really special and um yeah just being present even um with the like with having Berkeley um yeah I think Brian kind of said everything that was to be said with that but um yeah we really felt the presence of the Lord through that whole situation um the changes that could be made to be able to go to a closer hospital that um we had a couple of moments private just the two of us during it and um where I would like to actually pray speaking in tongues um have things committed and just feel that um, peace of the Lord through the situation. And, you know, that's a great joy to me that we have um, somewhere to go, um, someone to ask, things that can be done for us. And, yeah, you just want other people to be able to um, have those answers as well. And, yeah, I just like to thank God for that. All right. Praise the Lord. Wonderful testimonies there. How about a brother? Oh, your brother. Sorry, you put your hand up for a testimony or you have somebody on Zoom. Okay. Sister Penny Joe. Okay, brothers, you're off the hook until later. We have a visitor testimony. Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Um, yeah, Penny from Melbourne. It was great to meet most of you at camp um, and we're still here in Canada, up in Banff, having enjoyed a bit of cycling and hiking. Um, my testimony goes back to January 1979 where I found myself at a revival meeting. I was in Adelaide travelling, planning to travel to Perth with a girlfriend from school. I actually came from Melbourne but she'd been at camp and kept in touch with me. She, she'd received the Holy Spirit several years before and witnessed to me in high school, but I'd resisted. And we arranged this trip from Adelaide to Perth in the summer break while we were at uni. And um, so she, she'd spent two weeks at Karakalinga and then come up to Adelaide and we met there and I became convicted after several years of trying to push it aside um, and searching around in other places. Um, I said to her, I need to go to a meeting. And I didn't really know what I was going to find. I didn't understand the need to speak in tongues or be baptised. I just saw them as that as a ceremony that I could do anywhere, having been through ceremonies in the Church of England that I'd grown up in. But uh, went to this meeting on the, and it was a Tuesday night meeting straight after camp and there were hundreds of people there and lots of new young people who'd just been baptised and I think I just thought, well, if they can do it, I can do it. And I went up to the prayer line at the end of the meeting and said to the pastor um, that I wanted to know God and within seconds found myself speaking in a new language. And I praise the Lord for that because, as we know, that's what converts us, that's what changes us. I'd tried praying before sinners' prayers and giving my heart to Jesus, but this time I knew God had answered in the way that he, he wants to fill us with his spirit right inside and change our mind and our heart and our thinking. So I was happily baptised after that and um, began my walk the first month being with, with some brothers and sisters who travelled from Adelaide over to the west. We, um, we spent went to the meetings over there in Perth and um, I just soaked up what I had. I knew that it was a commitment for life and I was ready for it and... Thank God that, you know, he waited um, when I'd pushed it aside for so long. Um, so came back to Melbourne, continued my walk, joined the young people, met Chris, and we were married the following year and started a family. We've lived in a small country town, uh, at a town in Victoria in Warrnambool, um, where Chris was pastoring. Um, we were very young, but um, that was a, another learning experience. We then moved up to Canberra where we fellowshiped for a number of years and then back to Melbourne. Um, that was at a pretty tumultuous time. Just a year before, we had a big big split in a church there, but we found ourselves in a better place. Um, 
aligned with the fellowship that formed after that that um, division. And we've just enjoyed serving the Lord there, raising our family in a stable place, being able to enjoy all the things that fellowship offers, camps, um, obviously meetings, and and somewhere to bring people, um, having knowing that we've got the answer to life. Um, praise the Lord for being with us, our family for healing needs. Um, our middle son became severely depressed as a teenager, which was a pretty scary time. Um, he was a di- is a diabetic, and he wasn't really wanting to live. So we sought professional help from doctors, but it wasn't the answer. And after a couple of years, he um, we really started to just seek the Lord. We had been through this time, but I think Cameron was ready to start praying and trying to you know read the Bible and pray and really use the help of the Lord. And over a period of three months, um, this cloud lifted once we started that daily, seeking the Lord together and and reading a verse um, based on some scriptural counselling from one of the pastors in Canberra. And that was brilliant. He, um, He came out of it and was able to finish his year 12 and move on to uni and is now happily married and fellowshipping Um, in Canberra so that's probably one of our major victories Um, we've had the Lord protect us along the way and um, just thank him for all the blessings in our life and a future to come Amen We've got some prayer requests here, which we'll commit to the Lord now. Healing needed for Brother Nick Wong. Prayer for Vika's grandmother for salvation and for healing, and also for Brother James Thornley. So we know the Lord hears and answers prayer. This is real. We know that we pray in faith believing, and we'll do do that now together in prayer as we commit these needs to the Lord. Let's pray. Well, it's certainly good to be here at the meetings and um, look forward to the blessing that the Lord has for us today. Um, I I had the opportunity last night about 9.30 to bring some thoughts in um, Melbourne. Pastor Darrell asked me if I could do that. And with technology, um, makes it makes it possible for those things to happen, as we know. So... I'm I'm not going to talk about what I talked about last night. I've got a different talk for the assembly here. Um, But there's certainly been a direction that the Lord's had on my heart for the last couple of months um, relating to the foundation and the principles upon which our lives are built. And I spoke yesterday or last night in Melbourne about growing in grace. What I want to talk about is hope and faith. Or, or so faith and hope, same thing. So if we open and start in 1 Corinthians in chapter 13, please. 1 Corinthians in chapter 13. What I want to convey is that this topic, as with most of them that we've been looking at lately, it isn't just a topic of interest. It's the principles upon which our lives are now built, the foundations. And and so rather than just learning about these things, I trust that what we read in the scriptures, what we hear maybe from this talk as we do from others, we can identify with in our lives. And maybe sometimes we can identify that there is more for us than we may have yet seen. And I think that's true for every one of us, no matter how long we've been saved. Faith and hope. Um, last Sunday I spoke on, on um, the calling that, that God has for men and brothers. This talk, I guess, could be a little bit more directed for the calling that God has for sisters, although that's not the primary focus of bringing it. I love talking about the calling God has for sisters because I know it well. 
not because I'm a sister, but because it's, you haven't noticed, because it's the same calling God has for the church. And I love that. And as I look to minister and guide the assembly here, um, I've found a thrill over the years in looking to well, what, what's the calling of the church? Well, it's the same calling that God gives to the sisters. And it's why I'm able to speak passionately about how important the calling of sisters is in the fellowship and just how wonderful it is and how it's not, as it were, just a, a secondary subservient role, but a, an essential one as it relates to, to Christ and the church and his relationship with us. And faith and hope play an incredibly critical role in our lives if we let it, if we let it. And, and so I want to just go into a bit of detail, have a look at an example or two here of the impact and power of faith and hope working together to change our reaction to circumstance and make it different than, than how we would otherwise react. Faith and hope are critical. If we want to react and stay in the blessing and be a blessing and be steadfast in our salvation and, and not be uh, overly rocked and blown around by the, by the storms of life, faith and hope are essential to, to our stability and, and our usefulness in the Lord. We read here, familiar verse to us all, no doubt, in First, First Chronicles 13, and in verse 13, now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. The greatest of these is charity. And as we know, that word is the same in the original Greek text as love. So faith, hope, and love. And I like that verse because it gives us a perspective that love is the greatest of those things. And I agree with that. I see that in the scriptures and in my own experience in the Lord. We won't turn to it. I've quoted it a lot. But faith works by love, quote from Galatians. Faith which worketh by love. So if we don't have the love of God within us, and that comes by the Holy Ghost, we are going to look at that one today. If we don't have the love of God, we won't have the faith of God. We read in the scriptures in the book of Hebrews, without faith it's impossible to please him. But also without faith, we don't really have any great hope for the future. We might look forward to events, and I've known of people, and I don't like talking about individuals, but I knew someone once that I, that I did try to help for many years, and they very much were wired to look forward to something in the future. But it was always something natural, a holiday, a purchase of some description, a trip or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with looking forward to those things, but it doesn't require any faith to do that. That's what the world gets, you know. They, they go from one thing to another, and so they go from a series of highs and lows, they, they go on the trip and then, well, now what? Well, we've got to look forward to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And, and it was because there was a, a lack of faith. Faith brings real hope. Faith to cause us to believe that the Lord's on our side, he's with us day by day, we walk with him and he walks with us. Faith to know that all things work together for good and when we're in the most difficult of situations, we can look forward with great hope to the blessing that the Lord will bring as a result of it. You, don't, you can't do that without faith. So without love, you don't have faith, and without faith, you don't have hope, and the whole thing unravels. And, and we're back to what the world gets and what we had before we were saved without these three incredible pillars of our salvation operating in our life. It's not a case of I need to know about love, I need to learn about faith, and I need to try and figure out how to get hope. These are gifts that we're given that, that would, the Lord would have operate in our lives and that when they're working together as a well-oiled machine, the Lord's people are impenetrable, the Lord's people are strong, are victorious, overcomers, joyful and rejoicing testimonies of the power of God working in their life 
And all of that happens not out of strife and striving, not out of lawfulness and oppression. It happens organically, as it were, and, and it brings just fruit, brings growth. And, and the two that I want to focus in on today is faith and hope. And, and the examples I want to give you is faith that worked and that faith that generated a response that was based off the hope that the, the people that were given to look at in the scriptures as examples, and they're women in this case. A reaction that would have been different to if they had reacted according to their flesh and that brought untold blessing not only on their own lives, but those for generations to come. And that's the power of faith and hope working. I believe the scriptures abound with, with um, examples of women um, exercising this faith and hope, not because brothers are not able to, but there's a softness that typically comes with God-given true femininity, not the nonsense you hear in the world today. And, and for the sisters as, and the church, as we yield and submit ourselves to God's plan um, in, our, in all our lives, but that of the sisters to, to be guided, then the effect that that has radiates and ripples right throughout our lives and other lives around us, and that's an incredible thing. And that's the testimony of the whole church. Let's, um, let's go to First Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians in chapter 1. Paul here, as he was preaching to the people in Thessalonica, he, he said here in verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. So the things that these, this assembly was doing, it wasn't out of a lawful striving. It was a work of faith. They believed the promises, they acted on them, and, and they did. And labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. So here we, Paul was describing what he saw, and it was this working together, this effectiveness of love, faith, and hope operating within this assembly. And that's what I see in this fellowship here. That's why I saw all camp. Not a, a striving of the flesh and a, and a contending for, for this or for that, but a working together of people affected by the power of the Spirit of God and, and the love that God has shown towards all of us and, and the faith that that has brought to life in our lives on which we act that gives us a great hope for the future. And so our message, whilst direct sometimes, whilst might contain correction and admonishment and even maybe occasionally rebuke, is a message of great joy and hope. But it's not empty. It's not weak. It's powerful. It's not only life-changing, our message and our fellowship and our testimony. The prophecies of the Scripture tell us it's world-changing. And I don't think any of us fully grasp that concept entirely world changing the operation of love faith and hope in the lives of people who have given their their, their life to god in the life of the saints and and i don't think paul was looking to try and manipulate a theme here you know we read of these three things working together and we read we just read in in corinthians and i know paul wrote both letters but paul in verse 3 was just describing that fellowship there in thessalonica So we read it again, verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope. I said to the young people at camp, I said, look, I want to give you some advice. You're called to play the long game. And I described what I meant by that, that 
I encourage them to keep their eyes fixed on, on, on their salvation. And rather than just reacting to the minutia of daily events or circumstances that are in the immediate present, to, to look forward with, by faith, to the hope of the big picture of their salvation and their lives as they stay the course, as they remain faithful to the Lord, and rather than, as we see sadly in the world, being thrown about by, by following after their lusts or their feelings or their thoughts or their ideas to play the long game. Well, that's the patience of hope, this reality of hope that says, as I live my life the Lord's way, his blessing will flood down upon me. And that's our experience, it's our testimony. And that's what was happening here. And, and I love the word because as I read it, and I read descriptions like that, I can identify with it in the church now. I can, I can read that and I can identify it exactly with this fellowship. I'm not boasting. This is all God's work. There's no boasting, no room for that. God gets the glory for everything. But what a confirmation, what a encouragement it is to see that this isn't just doctrine and dry theology. These are the principles now on which our life are built, and they're so entirely different to what they were before we were saved. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. Yes, I know, I refer to this often. Don't necessarily read it as often as you hear about it quoted, but I did want to read it today in Romans 5. Verse 1. Therefore, being justified, that's declared righteous, Justification and righteousness essentially are the same things in the original Greek text. I'll get all my Greek references out before Pastor Manuel returns. <laughs> He's better at that than me. Therefore, being justified by faith. That's why our salvation is based on faith. We believe it. We're justified, and that's the faith of Jesus Christ who declares us righteous. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, coming back into a situation where we're, we're at peace with God, that's the peace that passes all understanding. We heard about that at camp. Verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So there's a lot there to unpack. Just keep in mind love works by faith. Faith gives is the gateway, it's the doorway to the, to the access of all of God's grace, all the fruits of the Spirit, and especially the joy that comes from the hope of the glory of God. And nowhere else do I see greater hope of the glory of God than in the church. I see it in creation. Don't get me wrong, there are other places to see and have hope in the glory of God. I see it in creation. That's why I love the creation that God did before man, man wrecked it. But most of all, I see this in the church, in you, and in, in all the fellowships around the world. And it brings great joy to my heart, this hope of the glory of God manifest in the world who we read in isaiah whose light will shine out of obscurity in the darkness of this world and we look forward to the day that happens in its fullness when jesus returns so here we see this operation working together love faith hope over and over and over again it's a pattern verse three and not only so but we glory in tribulations also and and what I want to point out is that's how we glory in tribulations. You know, people that glory in difficulties, we hard to understand. I think there's a term for it. It escapes me for now. There is one. Who glories in tribulations? How, how on earth, why on earth would you glory in, in tribulation? Well, typically you wouldn't. And typically you couldn't, unless you had something wrong in your head. But when faith and hope is working in your life, the one thing you do know when you're going through a trial is that you're going to see the power of God work. It might not happen exactly how you want or when you want, but faith will, will, will be alive in your heart whereby you'll know, but it will happen. 
And when it does, it'll be glorious. And that brings patience to wait for that glory. And it brings great hope when that glory arrives. But without faith and without love working, you never get there. All you get is constant drama, constant emotion, constant fear, constant anger. And who wants to live like that when we've got such an incredibly blessed alternative? So verse 3, not only so, but glory in tribulation also, knowing, this is why, that glory, sorry, that the tribulation works patience. With patience, experience, and experience, hope. And, and so the cycle of destruction is broken here. Most of the times when people go through tribulations, it, it often, especially without God in their life, it, it can ruin them. We see that sadly in the world. That's why we witness to people. And patience, experience, and experience, hope, and the hope, and hope, verse 5, makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. All the work's done. The hard work, everything we need for this to operate. Love, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Faith, access into the glory of God. Patience and hope. There's no better life or way to live this life now than that working, ever. You won't get better than that. And, and really all we need for that to occur is to let it happen. And sometimes we don't. We dive into a situation, boots and all, and get things backwards. Let's go to the book of Ruth in chapter 1 and we'll look at the main example for today that I wanted to highlight. Look, there is an incredible depth in the book of Ruth. It's just after Judges and just before the book of Samuel, if you're looking for it. There's a lot of parallels and, and a lot of concealed and hidden parallels here given with the book of Ruth and Ruth's actions and her calling that align with the church. And, and the main characters here with Boaz and, and the husbands and so on. And I certainly don't have time to, to outline all of those details today. And I'm not going to try because we'll be here for too long. I'll go over time and I'll regret that. But to set the stage, um, there was a woman of Israel named Naomi and her husband, Elimelech. There was a famine in Israel and they moved into the land of Moab. And, and I can understand that people might take the view that they should have never done that. They should have stayed in Israel. Maybe. I could see that. But all things work together for good, right? And, and the Lord can even turn some circumstances that maybe you think might not be ideal into incredible victories. Incredible victories. So we don't stand, or I don't stand anyway, in judgment of, of what they did there. They left Bethlehem, Judah. That's notable. The birthplace of Jesus. And we do come full circle here in this story. And they went to the land of Moab because of a famine. What that meant was the um, sons of Naomi and Elimelech married daughters of Moab. And the Moabites were, were the enemies of Israel in, in a general sense. We don't have time to go into their histories and where it all came from. But the Moabites were, were um, idolatrous people and they were a thorn in Israel's side. In the course of time, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. I've just got to give you a quick summary to set the scene. And his two sons married two Moabite daughters. It's interesting, you know, um, the two sons here of Naomi and Elimelech, in verse 5, and Melon and Chilion died, also both of them. And the woman was left with their, two, with their two sons and her husband. The names there of Melion or Melon and Chilion mean sick and wasting away. The story alone just in that. And, and they both died. 
leaving Naomi with her two daughters-in-law. One was called Orpah and the other one, Ruth. And, and we've looked many times, so again, I'm just going to summarize. The, the two daughter-in-laws reacted differently. Naomi said, look, I've lost everything. I've got nothing to give you. I'm going to go back to my home place in Bethlehem, Judah. Orpah ended up just staying there in, in the land of Moab. But Ruth's reaction was different. And I believe Ruth re reacted in a way that indicated a great faith and a great hope that, that made her different. It certainly made her react differently. Orpah stayed. Ruth stayed with Naomi and returned to Bethlehem, Judah. If you read in verse 16, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave or to return from following after thee. This was Ruth to Naomi. Naomi said, go back, Ruth, go back to, to your, your people. And Ruth said, don't, don't ask me to do that. For whither thou goest, will I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Here was this dedication this faithfulness that Ruth had to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Ruth the Moabitess, essentially in that state, considered herself an Israelite. And so we start to see a parallel here of our salvation when we come and become part of the children of God. And... and the Lord requires of all of us this level of dedication, this stickability, this faithfulness, not out of a lawfulness of I've joined, I joined a, a church, I, I can't leave it, but I've married into the Lord's family through my union with Jesus Christ. Nothing will see that severed. And, and so we start to, to read the, um, the unfolding of a, of a chain of events that changed world history. You might think that's an incredibly bold statement, but it did. Ruth was the great-grandmother of King David. And I'm, I'm skipping right to the end of the story. All right? And it was from the line of David that Jesus was born. So Ruth became, an, even though she was a Moabitess, an integral part to the unfolding of the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant in the, full, fulfillness, in the fullness of being a direct, well, having Jesus himself through his natural mother Mary come out of her descendants or be one of her descendants. And it was because of the operation of Ruth's faith and the hope that she had in the God of Israel and the qualities and the quality of her decisions in uncertainty and in difficult times that set her so vastly apart from Orpah, Orpah her sister-in-law. And I've seen people go both ways when it, as it relates to their walk in the Lord. I've seen those that cleave to their salvation, to the Lord in love, and they don't depart. And I've always, always, always seen the blessing and joy and, and rejoicing that, that results from that. I've also seen the opposite, which I don't want to talk about today because that's heartbreaking. So we read on in verse um, 17, where thou diest, I will die. And where thou will be, where, where thou will, sorry, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she, Naomi, saw that she, Ruth, was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So she gave up and said, all right, let's go. And, and they went to Bethlehem, not by chance, not by coincidence. There's a parallel in a story here that is just incredible. They went to Bethlehem. We know that that's the birthplace of Jesus. Right, where do I want to pick this up? In verse 20, 
Um, well, verse 19, so they, they too went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them, and they said, is this Naomi? So they obviously remembered Naomi. They wouldn't have known who Ruth was, but they remembered her. Verse 20, and she said unto them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara. Naomi means pleasant, Mara means bitter. So Naomi was a bit bitter because of the circumstances that she'd been through, the loss, the devastation of her husband, and then her two sons. And, and you could put forward the case that maybe that, that was a result of, of them being in Moab rather than in Bethlehem. Not 100% sold on that idea myself. But whatever it is, the circumstance of her life, Naomi had been damaged. She was a bit bitter. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Now she's, that bitterness always brings an accusatorial attitude. Now here she is accusing God. So sadly, those, these circumstances in her life had affected understandably Naomi, but they'd affected her badly. And the fruit of that was bitterness. I've seen that too. Ruth's reaction was different to Naomi's. Ruth was one of steadfastness and faith and hope. Verse 22, so Naomi, Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabites, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. Perfect timing. Here God's hand was on them. Now Naomi didn't even have a clue that God was guiding them, but in the right place and the right time, God led them. And I believe God was able to do this because of the faith and the hope that was alive in Ruth. And because of that faith and hope, Naomi benefited greatly, Ruth benefited greatly, and so God's plan was able to be fulfilled through their line. Perfect timing. I've seen a lot of God's perfect timing over the last couple of years. It, it just blows you away. Well, here it is in action again. If we go to chapter 2, verse, um, verse 2, And Ruth the Moabites said unto Naomi, Let me now go into the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. No, Ruth here wanted to find grace. She was diligent. She wanted to glean from the harvest. It speaks of all the qualities that God has called the church to be. She, didn't, she did this voluntarily. It was her idea. Let me go. I'll just pick up after what, what, what the reapers leave behind from the barley harvest. I'll just collect the remnants. You know, we're called to do that. Looking for this soul here, the precious seed of the earth, which is, I know is the word, but this soul here and that soul there in humility. in search, as it were, and we have found it. After him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. So Naomi gave Ruth permission to go. And she, Ruth, went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap, her hap, what is that? It, it indicates there that this was it just so happened. It was not by Ruth's design or, or necessary cunning or intent, but by happenstance. We all might say by coincidence. It wasn't happenstance and it wasn't coincidence. It was providence. God had his hand in their life. And Ruth didn't even probably realize to the extent, right down to the small detail. Ruth just thought, I'll go glean in this field. But this field just so happened to belong to a particular person, Boaz. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was the kindred of Elimelech. So Boaz was related to, to her father-in-law. And due to the laws of succession, 
it gave Boaz the right as a kindred of, um, of the family to fulfill the role of a kinsman and take Ruth to wife. The problem with this plan, which was God's plan, and it did eventuate, is that there was a hitch in that idea. There was a kinsman that was a nearer kinsman, so one that was more closely related. And he had the lawful right of taking Ruth to wife before Boaz. And you might wonder, well, what's the significance of that? I'd love to go into it in detail, but the nearer kinsman who's not even named represents the Old Testament law, the, the Old Covenant. Boaz represented the New Covenant and the relationship with which Christ would enter into the church under. So we read on here, verse 4, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered unto him, The Lord bless thee. So he was a godly man. Then said Boaz unto the servant that was set over the reapers, Who is this? Whose damsel is this? Who's this person in the field gleaning? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Verse 7, And she, and she said, I pray you, let me glean. This is the servant answering Boaz, by the way. She, he's relaying the conversation. I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came, and she hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little while in the house. So she was clearly diligent, self-motivated. What was motivating her? I'll tell you now, faith, love, and hope. She didn't have at this point in time, without faith, she had nothing to be hopeful. She was destitute. She was really, in, in a sense, a beggar. And here's this incredible strength that comes from humility of heart. She could have bemoaned her state and the unfortunate circumstance that she currently was in. She could have gotten bitter and had a pity party with Naomi real easy. Ring any bells of the re reactions of the flesh? But she didn't do that. She went out and did what she could do. A bit like the woman with the alabaster box of ointment in the New Testament, she did what she could do. And here's this incredibly humble and yet extraordinarily powerful calling that God has given to the church and to sisters that is automatically fulfilled with this working together of love, faith, and hope. And the outcome is always miraculously astonishing. Verse 8, then, then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast in, by my maidens. So Boaz's encouragement to Ruth, don't go anywhere else. Stay in this field. Of course, there's a great parallel there as we think of Christ and the church and our salvation, our part in the fellowship. Verse 9, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. And go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? So she came under Boaz's protection. He told the young men, leave her alone. Don't harass her. Don't touch her. He provided her safety, comfort, and assurance, none of which she got if she would have got if she hadn't have acted in faith with hope of a miraculous outcome, and she got it. The, the life of a Moabitish woman in Israel at that time would not have been pleasant. But Ruth's fate was different because of her faith. But not just blind faith, faith that brought action, Faith that caused Ruth to react differently to Naomi and everyone else. And Boaz saw that faith. He respected it. And so he brought Ruth under his protection. 
and he brought her under his provision. We keep reading in verse 9. And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So here's a provision of water. So now she's got food and water and protection. Then she fell down or fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said, Why have I found grace in thine eyes? Ruth's incredible humility. She wasn't self-entitled she wasn't bemoaning herself when she found favor in boaz it humbled her even more and she asked the question why have i found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me seeing i'm a stranger and this speaks of our relationship with god and i've felt this i've often been rejoicing in the blessing and provision and protection of the lord and then the realization hits me i'm not worthy of this why me i don't think i've ever found an answer to that question for me anyway but for ruth it's faith love and hope it's probably the same for all of us if i'm being honest boaz answered in verse 11 boaz answered and said unto her it hath fully been shown me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and art come unto a people which thou knewest not henceforth boaz respected her total commitment she left the world behind and totally embraced her salvation her life with the people of god she was not double-hearted she was not double-minded she was not will i go will i stay will i go will i stay will i be on the fence will i try and do both she was committed boaz saw it he respected it he loved it and through that he made great provision for ruth verse 12 boaz goes on the lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord of his, the Lord God of Israel, under whose wing thou art come to trust. There's the faith that Ruth had in God. Boaz saw it. Just as Jesus sees your faith in God, and he loves you for it. He brings you under his protection. He provides for you bread and water. And protection, food and abundance. In fact, Boaz went even further and he told his, his reapers, make sure you leave a whole plenty behind, miss some stuff so that Ruth's got plenty to gather up. It's an incredible love story. It speaks of the love story between Christ and the church. And the central theme is the working of faith and the hope that it brings but then it illustrates the outcome of the working of faith and hope, which was the union between Boaz and, and Ruth that came about. Now, I alluded earlier to a nearer kinsman. I'm running out of time. I don't have time to go into to the, the, the detail of it all. Verse 16 of chapter 2, Boaz said, And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, for Ruth. And leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not so he, he said on purpose leave some behind so she doesn't have to work too hard how incredible is that and that speaks of the goodness and kindness of god in our life and and our relationship with the lord jesus christ chapter 3 verse 3 naomi gave ruth some instruction and she said to ruth wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment upon thee and get thee down to the floor but make not thyself known unto the man, unto Boaz, until he hath done eating and drinking. And it shall, come, it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou should do. What incredible humility Ruth must have had to, to follow this instruction and even to listen to it. It reminds me of Mary who sat at Jesus' feet. 
She wasn't too proud to do so. She just wanted to, the Lord to, to instruct her and to tell her what to do where Martha missed out. And, and so that's exactly what happened. She did exactly as she'd been instructed. And it set into motion an incredible set of events that, it, that ended in her being married to Boaz. That never would have happened if there hadn't have been this other sequence of events that led up to it. And all of it depended on Ruth's reaction to negative circumstances. And it was a reaction of faith and hope that brought forth incredible an incredible outcome. I don't have time to look at this nearer kinsman. Like I said, it's a type of the relationship that, that existed under the Old Testament law. We go to chapter 4 and verse, verse um, 13. This is we summarize the, the whole book. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the woman said unto Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. I see that as almost prophetic. They didn't know that, that Ruth's children would ever amount to anything. But here's this prophecy that thy name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, or if without thee, in italics there, a restorer of life. Remember Jesus came from this lineage this union of, of Boaz and Ruth, and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, there's love. So love, faith, and hope worked in right throughout here. Which is better to thee than seven sons have borne him. And Naomi took the child and so on. In verse um, 17, and the woman and the women her neighbours gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. Naomi was the, the grandmother. It was Ruth's child from Boaz. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. And so we see the, the incredible blessing. Now, there's a lot of other examples we could look at that, that illustrate this point of the operation of faith, hope, and love, the grace of which is love. We could look at the story of Esther, and how she reacted so differently to Vashti. We can look at Rahab as we have not that long ago, and, and despite her unfortunate history, was held in high regard right through into the New Testament and down to today. Rebecca, Isaac's wife, an incredible story there of faith and hope and love operating in how she reacted. Mary, um, th there's another one also with the... I think she was a Canaanitish woman that came and worshipped the Lord. And, and the response that Jesus gave her was quite gruff and abrupt, and he said, it's not meat, it's not suitable for me to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. Jesus called this woman a dog in type. And this woman's response to him was, yes, but the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Her reaction was not bitterness. It was not in any way retaliatory offended and hurt, as you could well understand it to be, this woman reacted in faith. I'm paraphrasing because of time now. The story's in Matthew 15, if you want to read it. We won't turn to it now. And, and Jesus was blown away with this woman's response because it was so different to what typically he would have expected. And the response that Jesus gave to this woman when she said, yeah, I'll have the crumbs that fall from the master's table. I'll glean in the field. Jesus said, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. The woman's faith was demonstrated in her humility and the way she responded to an adverse situation. And, the Lord, and that woman's daughter was made whole from that very hour the incredible power, victory, miracles that come from the working of faith, hope, and love 
It should never be understated. Romans chapter 7. We'll start to wrap things up right away. <laughs> Romans chapter 7. This talk's going to come to a screeching halt. I'm nearly out of time. Verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, you, are also, you also are become dead to the law. The law is the near kinsman that had, I guess, first right of refusal to, to Ruth. You become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And it's the relationship between Christ and the church as husband and wife that can cause a brother, as dense as we can be, to understand the calling of sisters, because it's the same as the calling between Christ and the church. And it revolves around the operation of faith and hope that comes from love in our lives, in our hearts, in our families, and in our homes, and an extension of that in our fellowship. And God sees it, God loves it, and God makes great provision because of it. That's what we all enjoy. Let's finish in 2 Corinthians 10. Second Corinthians in chapter 10. Verse 1, I read this chapter through this morning. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Ruth didn't lay herself down at any old someone's feet. She laid herself down at Boaz's feet and experienced Boaz's gentleness, Boaz's meekness, Boaz's kindness. But it required a great faith for her to do it and a great humility, as it does for every one of us. Unfortunately, the teachings of this world towards women are the polar opposite of that. And so it interferes with the opportunity for faith and hope and love to work if sisters in particular are affected by the idiotic notions of what women should be like today strong-headed, strong-willed, independent, the total opposite to what brings eternal life, to what brings provision, to what brings miracles. And that's why we've got nothing to learn from the world. And in verse, six, uh, verse 18, same chapter, chapter 10, for he that commendeth himself, for not, sorry, for not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. And, and might seem like an odd place to finish, but the Lord, we are joined to the Lord in marriage. We'll see the full consummation of that marriage when the Lord returns to the earth. But it's the Lord that has commended and approved us. And, and his approval um, comes by his commendation of his provision of water, his provision of protection, his provision of, of food to eat for our souls, all of which we enter into because of his faith and his love and his hope that he's given to all of us. That's incredible. That's it. I'm out of time. I'm way out of time. So I think we'll leave it, leave it there and go straight into communion service.